right? He said, yes. I said, you need to visit your mother every day for 15 or 20 minutes, and then you need to go home, because that's all you can endure with equanimity, and it does her no greater service because she doesn't know you're there anymore. That's so powerful. Do, do, yeah, it's, you're making it very clear. And also, another interesting dynamic is whether we're dealing with extremely rational, functional families, or totally off the wall, dysfunctional, all the issues come to surface at such a difficult time. And so not only are people dealing with the, the sick people or the dying people, but all the interdynamics that are, attach themselves to that. How soon should they find a shrink or a spiritual advisor to help them through that? Well, I, you know, I, I think that this is a time when pastoral care is important. Um, you know, if you belong to a parish or a church or a synagogue, or this is time. This is the time when your spiritual, pastoral person should be there. Most hospitals have wonderful, uh, and hospices, you know, have chaplains, uh, both lay and ordained. And this is a very wonderful ministry and something to avail oneself of. Um, again, depending on, you know, sometimes there are people in the family. You know, the sick person says, "I, I was, I was with a." A man many years ago who, who passed away, and he would say to me, he was dying of cancer, and he would say to me, my wife comes and she sits in the room and she cries all day and it makes me crazy. Mm -hmm. and, and I love her and I can't stand to see her in so much pain. And, and you got to help me. And she wouldn't leave. She didn't want to leave. So I would come and visit. And um, how can I put this politely on television? We would start to tell colorful jokes and anecdotes. And she would come and become embarrassed, but she'd laugh, and she'd finally have to leave the room and go get a cup of coffee. And that was our way of, she wouldn't otherwise take a break, and it gave him a break, and she needed a break. And it was a little silly, you know, but God, God uh -huh. understands these things. Uh -huh. And, um, and, and so, so there's that, and then there's, you know, the, the loving daughter who flies in from Chicago to, you know, be at her father's deathbed. And, you know, okay, uh, you know, I, I wish she had gone home, this one particular young woman, you know, to get a good night's sleep. She was exhausted, but she wasn't leaving that room, so I wasn't going to tell her to leave the room. Mm -hmm. I figured by tomorrow she'd figure it out, which she yeah. did. Hmm. So it brings to mind um, two different issues. I'm thinking of both um, guilt, which the Irish, we are very good at guilt, <laughs> um, also creativity. and. The interblending of creativity, as you just said, going in and just telling jokes <coughs> to make the, the mm -hmm. woman laugh. You know, I can remember working with some uh, sisters, elderly sisters, beautiful community uh, in Patterson, but um, they, their minds had become very weak, and uh, they just, when it was time to, to bathe or to shower, mm -hmm. here are these lovely sisters who took uh, vows of uh, poverty, chastity, you know, modesty, and obedience. Um, you know, were asked to just strip down naked and be thrown in, in, in a very, very loving way. And so I would sneak them into the shower with their, <laughs> with their, their underclothes on, and they were so thrilled that we could still get the job done. So um, no, exactly. that's a secret many days. I, 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 was a, I was a caretaker for my wife's elderly uncle for five years before he passed away. And, and I, one of my jobs was to give him a shower every day. Um, and he was, you know, embarrassed, but, you know, we figured out a way to do it. And, um, um, again, with this sense of humor, and I also think a sense of wonderful divine irony. Uh, you know, life has a full circle. During that time, I was asked uh, by a young woman, um, daughter of a friend of mine, if I would sing at her wedding. I had sung at her mother's wedding. Oh. Now, this was back in, in the day, you know, when it was, you know, come to Jesus and hold notes and, you know, kumbaya. <laughs> so I said to her, well, well certainly, sweetie, I'd be, I'd be honored to sing at your wedding. What would you like me to sing? And she said, could you sing the Panis Angelicus? Mm -hmm. I went, oh, my God. So I ran to our choir director, and I was practicing and practicing and practicing. And I would practice singing the Panis Angelicus, the hymn of Thomas Aquinas to the Holy Eucharist, the body of Christ, the bread of life, while I was giving Uncle Ronald his shower. <laughs> okay, because... That's when I needed to see his body as the body of Christ, uh -huh. aged, frail, failing as it was, trying to help him have as much dignity as he could possibly have. And that was my way of, 
it's very hard to be impatient when you're singing the Panis Angelicus <laughs> at the top of your lungs. Just in Latin. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? But also, he would get crotchety and he would get angry. And I mean, he was, you know, he would soil himself. It was just, he, you know, it was a problem. And we decided that sometimes we just had to yell. But in, the rule in my house was nobody yelled at each other. So we decided that if any of us got upset, we could turn to the nearest wall and yell at the wall. <laughs> and I remember this one day, my wife came in, and the two of us were standing next to each other in the hallway, <laughs> screaming at the wall together. Did it answer back? Uh, no, it didn't. Okay. But, but, but again, it's, this stuff sounds ridiculous, and yet when you're under this enormous, enormous strain. Now, we also got to the place, I mean, I don't want to, this is not a show about me, but as an example, we got to a place with Ronald, he didn't want to go into the hospital. He didn't want to go into hospice. He wanted to die in our home. And we got to a point where I couldn't care for him adequately. I had been up for five nights running. I, I couldn't function. And he had to go to the hospital. And we told him that. And, um, and, uh, and it was a very difficult decision, but he agreed. And it was because he was part of a family. As much as we wanted to give him the kind of death that he wanted, it turned out that it was beyond my capacity to do. I couldn't do it. Yeah. I was going to. I was going to have a breakdown, yeah. and so we had to bring him. We're getting ready to. Actually, we're getting ready for him to be in hospice. He was in the intensive care unit. He, you know, he was having hospice arrangements, and um, he was very upset. And and uh, my wife, his niece, said, you know, you've got to go see Ronald. He's just. He's just beside himself. And I went, and he was throwing the water pitcher around and just yelling at the nurses. And I said, Ronald, what's the matter? What's the matter? And he, he said, I'm really scared. Oh, he said, I haven't been such a good person. Uh, I said, OK. So I prayed with him. I gave him absolution. And I said with him, Ronald, this is God's final exam. One question, if you get it right, you're going straight to heaven. He said, what's that? I said, if you continue to be rotten to the doctors and nurses, pack the sunblock. You're going to a place that's too warm. <laughs> if you can pack be nice to the doctors, if you can be nice to the doctors and nurses while you're struggling like this, <laughs> straight to heaven. Well, my wife went back a couple of hours later and she came home and she said, what did you say to him? He's Mr. Please and thank you and God bless you for being so kind to me. And he died within 12 hours. Uh, um, wow. Sometimes you got to make it yeah. simple. <laughs> you know, he was a very simple, uneducated man. Um, so, that we, so I know from personal experience the struggle of, of finding balance between what you can do and what you can't do and what you ought to do. Always seeking God's grace. You know, what we forget when we make decisions as Christians, what we forget is that we need to give God a chance to weigh in. Okay. Everybody says, oh, I'll pray about it. Nobody does. It's a big mistake. You think about it. You use the intellectual and cognitive powers that God gives us. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to think. But then we're supposed to take what we've thought, and take what we feel, and bring it to prayer and see what God yeah. reveals to special us. Special alchemy I, that takes place the with grace. Special yeah. alchemy that takes place with grace. You know, mm -hmm. God doesn't send us notes or see flashing things in the sky, but the revelation is there. Not just consolation, but revelation is there to guide us. You know, the, the, the gospel for uh, Trinity Sunday says, you know, Jesus says, you know, that he'll guide us in the way of all truth. That the Spirit will come and guide us in the way of all truth. And we need to avail ourselves of that. Yeah. The um, ultimate letting go, I'm thinking recovery circles, you know, let go and let God, that is the final ultimate letting go, both to the person who's going through the experience and for the caretaker. Well, Father Jim, you know, I, I have a very important question. I think of all the people I know, you'd be the one to answer this. Um, can you please tell me, what is God's email address? <laughs> www.jesus.com. <laughs> um. Okay. I thought you how often. <laughs> I think how often you know we, uh, you know we, we, have, we sandwich them in between the emails. We've got so much of that going on today. Well, but you know, and this is a little off point. Don't forget to use, and I say this to you and to the viewers. Don't forget to use your email list as a prayer list. Sit down in the morning or sometime during the day. Beautiful. Go through your email list and pray for every person on the list and then do something really radical. Send them